So it makes sense to do it this way. And on top of that, as a developer, there's a bunch of um, uh, uh, like CodeSmith templates and things out there that actually generate most of this code. Most, the code from the business components down, all right, not counting the business logic you write in your application, but like the, the calls that load the data up into your business objects, from, from the green layer down can largely be generated for you. You don't have to write that code. You, know, you, you create your database structure as a developer, you do that manually. Then you point a tool at your database structure and have it generate store procedures. You know, normal update and retrievals, you know, the CRUD procedures that you want. Typically, those are the kind of procedures. You, know, you may have to create a, a few manually, you know, that, that do specific things. And then the business objects and things, if you get the right templates, like CodeSmith templates, they, they will generate the business objects in the proper <coughs> format for the .NET new module to run. So you don't actually have to write any of that code yourself. It, and it makes your job a hell of a lot easier. Um, okay, so that's the architecture kind of in a nutshell. Um, come back next month and Daryl will, will tell you a whole lot more about what's underneath the covers. I'll talk about a little bit of it as we go through here. All right, so custom modules basically consist of a module container which is provided by .NET Duke itself. And that's the, that's a, um, it's, it's that, it's that. The wrapper around the module, you know, on a page. So, if you if you actually apply a container, which is like a skin to the module, you know, your your container will I'll use the word container twice, but but anyway, you can decorate the module, um, you know, in, in effect skinning that module in any way that you want to. So that container is provided by .NET Hoop, and your user controls get injected into the container at runtime. Um, okay, so. We've, we've kind of talked about what's what's there. So you've got this module container, you've got your user controls that go into it, and then you've got your data layer in there with all the business logic. So the, the development process goes just like you'd expect it to. All right, so now you talk about development, you're talking about building any kind of ASP.NET application. Developing for .NET for Nucleus is, is just the same as developing any kind of ASP.NET web app, except you're building user controls and not ASPXP. Right. So you're going to have a project set up, uh, step, you're going to build the data and the business logic layers, you're going to create your user controls, <coughs> and you're, then where it diverges a little bit, you're going to create a package for the installation, which is actually an, an automated process, and then you'll deploy this package. So that's kind of the basic things that you're, you're going to go through. And as I mentioned earlier, you can do your model development in any language, you don't have to use DB. Alright, so let's look at each of those in a little bit more detail. So. Uh, creating database objects, tables of store procedures, generally you're going to do that manually. You know, what, what data is out there is kind of up to you as a, as a designer of the module. All right, so you have to figure out what, what tables, and you know, so I've got two tables for this module. You know, there's the suggestions table itself, and then the suggestions types. So you're, uh, you're often going to want to use this object, this uh, unique object prefix. Um, uh, I used an underscore here instead of a dot, but, um, but you're, again, you're going to want to use like a unique name for your objects so you don't collide with anybody else's that happens to name your module similar to yours. So then you're going to generate your stored procedures um, you know, with some sort of a code gen tool. You typically don't want to do that by hand. There's lots and lots of these ORM type tools out there. Um, um, you know, Subsonic and uh, Subsonic is a, a uh, source code control that's um, I'm trying to think of. Um, I use Subsonic. Subsonic is the bad access layer. Yeah. It, okay, so it is the ORM. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of the one. I love Subsonic. <laughs> so, so Subsonic's a good example. And, yeah. and you know, the, the Microsoft has got several tools to do so that too. So um, fields that you typically are going to include in a database are going to include the module ID, you know, because each, each time you cite a module on a page, it gets a unique ID. So you have to have, and you can have more than one instance of your module on a page. So each of them has a, a unique module ID so that you can tell them apart. There's going to be an item ID, so that would be like each individual suggestion that's in a module. You're going to have a created by and created date, you know, who, who entered that piece of information when it was created. So those are the four pieces that you're probably always going to have, and then there's, there's typically going to be a whole list of other fields, you know, depending on what's on the form. And as you're going through the development process, you probably want to create some database scripts for yourself, you know, so because you're going to be, you know, generating and deleting and generating and, you know, the, the usual iterative process that you go through when you're creating a data layer. Um, you might even want to build scripts with sample data in them, depending on what you're doing. That way you don't have to 
populate it manually every time you in there to play. So that just stuff that you're going to do as a developer uh, during data layer definition. And there's a couple of, uh, of uh, guides that come along in you know documents that, that they supply with .NET new the data access and module dev uh, guides are really good. They're both about this thick, and they have a lot of detail about doing this stuff. Okay, so then the uh, the business logic layer. Um, so, yes. first on the guides. Yes. Um, I noticed like all the documentation has with .NET new five. A lot of this documentation hasn't been updated. Have those guides been updated? They have not, and the reason is because the actual custom module development architecture in .NET new hasn't changed since version three. But like the manifest. Yeah, the, uh, they are going to have to do some updating for things like the new package formats. And I think that they have uh, written some individual documents to describe those, and they haven't played with the, the original like, module development. They haven't fiddled with that yet. I'm not sure why not. It would seem to me that they would want to keep that documentation right up to date, but I think it just becomes a lot of overhead on them. I really thought they would do it for version 5. And, you know, now that they've got funding, I'll bet you they hire that out. And they'll actually get somebody to, to build real documentation mm -hmm. for it. For internals. Have you, are you aware of any other documentation that's out there that's good to go get? It has been updated. Nina Myers um, sells uh, like admin documentation. Um, I, there's several other books. I know that. Uh, Mitch, no, I meant for module development. Mitch Sellers in particular is just putting out a book on module development. In fact, I was I was searching around on Amazon and, and uh, Barnes and Noble yesterday, and they were saying people who bought. Professional .NET 5 also bought Mitch Seller's module development book. They're buying them as a bundle. You know, so you know how Amazon bundles things together, gives you discounts, more discounts. So they're already starting to bundle the books together. Great. And, and in fact, our book is already the, the 95th bestseller on ASP.NET on oh, Amazon. Cool. So I mean, it hasn't even come out yet. It's still still a month or two out. So people are actually buying them. All right, so I mentioned earlier then, the, you hope so. I hope so. The easiest starting point is, is to take an existing module and rename it. And, and generally what, what I do um, to make it easy for me is I download you know, all, the, all the source code for all the standard modules that have been new. Because they're all free, the source code's all there, they're all professionally done, they've done it right. And I just unzip them all into a big directory structure. And then I search that directory structure. So if I'm looking for how do I do permissions, I just search that directory structure for examples. And you know, use the object browser to figure out you know what the object um, uh, structure looks like, um, and actually look for examples in that code of how to make calls into into the various methods that I'm looking at, objects that I'm looking for. So, um, and and it's it's like I said, it's far easier to start with an existing module and just rename things in and just to start from scratch. Just my opinion. Okay, so project templates. If you want to start from scratch in the starter kit. Uh, we already talked about Codesmith templates a little bit. The, actually, when you search for them, they're for DNN3. But like I said, the, the actual module architecture hasn't changed since DNN3. They did a really good job of, describe, of, of defining how modules would go together in that, that colored architecture picture. So they haven't had to change it. Um, I mean, there's been no breaking changes at all since DNN3. In fact, um, um, I took this module. I actually wrote it originally in DNN1. Now, you know, in one to two, there was a big step change. All right, we actually went to a data architecture similar to this. And between two and three, there were a few minor changes that were breaking. But um, so I, I originally wrote my module in version one. I manually upgraded it to version two back in the day. Um, I uh, didn't have to make any changes to go to version three. And when I opened the version three module in version five, it worked the first time. I mean, it just worked. So I mean, it's that's that's the beauty of a well-defined architecture. When, when, it, when it gives you, you know, continuity over time. Okay, so there are some interfaces that we'll talk about when we get in the code briefly. There's an iPortable, and basically that's the import-export module um, menu items. So let's say you create a staging site. You know, you have a production site somewhere up on a hosted uh, environment. You have a staging site down here, say on a dev machine like mine. I create my content for a module. I export it from the local module. I import it into that module on on the production site, and the entire you know formatted, beautifully done content shows up in that module on the on the hosted site. So that's a that's a way of staging 